So yeah, um, so I work for Expedia Group uh, here in our, in our Brisbane office. I work for our Cloud Center of Excellence team, uh, focused on cloud finance, cloud cost optimization. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking a bit about FinOps, what is FinOps, our journey at Expedia Group. And uh, then I'll talk also about Kubernetes and optimizing Kubernetes in the cloud. So a bit of a double header talk today. Uh, if you don't know much about Expedia, we've been around for a long time. Uh, a lot of websites all around the world. Uh, so we power a, a significant portion of the online travel industry. Um, thousands of applications and hundreds of clusters, just to give you a bit of an idea of our, our scale. Can I see a show of hands who here before coming to the conference had heard of FinOps before? A few. Anyone actually involved in a FinOps role or function? A couple. Yeah, great. Well, we're going to dive in and, and, and talk a bit about it. What is FinOps? It's a combination of finance and DevOps. Literally, that's, that's how it was defined as a portmanteau between the two. You might hear it called financial operations, but that's a misnomer. Uh, that's actually a role within the finance industry and the term is overloaded. It can also be called uh, cloud financial management or engineering or optimization, cloud cost management, whatever you call it. If you call it FinOps or something else, it's all about managing cost in the cloud. And it's essentially about collaboration between business and engineering. And it's about getting the most business value out of your cloud spend. So it's not about reducing cloud spend, but tying cloud spend to business value and making the, the two of those work together. If you wanna know more about it, this is the book to read, the Cloud FinOps book. The second edition came out about 12 months ago. Uh, J.R. Stormont, one of the authors there, worked for one of the cloud cost vendors for a while, so he has a lot of knowledge from the industry. And Mike Fuller worked for Atlassian as part of their cloud optimization team. And so they bring a lot of years of, of history and uh, knowledge. And the book's filled, of, uh, f you know, filled with lots of pearls of wisdom and war stories. And it's a great way to understand why we want to do uh, FinOps and get business and engineering working together. So FinOps, we need it because we've got cloud DevOps. So imagine a world without FinOps where you scale up quickly in the cloud. You have faster time to market, you have lots of microservices going out there, you have lots of customer demand, you have revenue coming in, but you've also got higher cost. And your five-year CapEx planning model starts to fall down because they're looking at this and saying, wait a minute, spend is no longer predictable. I'm seeing these spikes in cost, and where's all this money coming from? Where's it going to? You see anomalies in spend, some of it's positive, some of it's negative. So the positive spikes, like there's you know, a sudden customer demand, sudden surge in, in usage uh, and revenue, but you see the negative anomalies where there's a sudden surge because someone's left a, a, you know, an inference training model, some, some sort of massive instance training for four days over the weekend, and there's no way to correlate those costs. So they all look like negative anomalies. We misinterpret that and we pull the pin and we say we're going back to the data center, reduce time to market, customer satisfaction reduces and reduce revenue. So FinOps is about combining finance and DevOps. So DevOps brings the engineering, the automation, the collaboration, this idea of fast feedback and reducing silos. And from finance, we bring all accounting principles and business value, monetary responsibility. These two worlds don't have a lot of knowledge of each other. So finance brings some of that financial control and DevOps brings some of that ownership of, you know, this is how we spin up cloud resources and this is how we do stuff in the cloud. And then FinOps meets in the middle, this idea of collaboration, predictability, and centralizing best practices and sharing, sharing the idea of ownership. So about centralizing how we're going to do finance in our organization work with our teams. We compare the two. They both started as a conference conversation, a sidebar conversation. So J.R. Stallman was at a conference, at a talk about DevSecOps. He said, we should do FinOps. We need FinOps. So he took, uh, he took Dean Kim's definition of DevOps and he kind of reworded it as a movement that focuses on collaboration between DevOps and finance, managing cloud spend, lowering unit economics increasing the cost, efficiency, and, portability, and profitability of the cloud environment. 
And it's actually well defined. So DevOps was kind of a, a movement, a loose thing. Uh, you know, we, we, it's kind of a feel. It's, uh, we want to get Dev and Ops working better together. Whereas FinOps have been very purposeful in going out and defining it. They've set up a FinOps foundation. So similar to the CNCF, it's part of the Linux foundation. You can do training courses, get yourself certified. You can get a little LinkedIn uh, badge against your profile if you do a, a course like I have, and there's a bunch of different courses you can do. And they're great because they give you enough knowledge to know about FinOps and how to talk to other people about it. And FinOps teams are actually encouraged. So DevOps was always, there's no such thing as a DevOps team. You're creating another silo in between two silos. Whereas FinOps, they encourage having a centralized team to, uh, you know, to, to, to try and come up with these best practices and spread them across across the organization. It might be a virtual team that's staffed by different people across different parts of the org, but the idea of centralizing it. Basically, you can think of cloud cost as usage times rate. And you can think of chargebacks. So when we've got all of our cloud cost, how do we attribute that to the different people, the different users in our organization? You can consider that as the cost divided by the usage per application. There's a one-pager that talks you through the whole framework that's really uh, sort of succinctly defines it. It's good to know. There's five different personas, so you can get training as any of these personas and know enough about what your persona needs to know. Um, and then also enough about the other personas so you can have a, a decent conversation with them. The six well-defined domains that you can dive deep in depending on where you are and in your journey. You'll hear them talk about crawl, walk, and run. Are you at the crawl phase or the walk phase or the run phase of your journey. That's pretty kind of straightforward. And then the life cycle has three different phases, inform, optimize, and operate. And the first stage, inform, is about visibility and allocation. So i.e. tagging, all right? The basic kind of day one thing is, do you tag your resources? And can you allocate the cost of your resources? Then optimize is about, well, let's look at the rates that we're paying to our cloud providers and let's look at the usage. Can we optimize any of these? And what's some ideas that we can come up with based on our usage and our predicted usage going forward? And then you take those ideas from the optimize phase, and you bring them into the operate phase where you, you, you en enact those, uh, yeah, those ideas that you've come up with and bring that back into the life cycle with continuous improvement. So the last chapter of the book says the nirvana of FinOps is making decisions on the value of cloud spend, no matter what method you use to measure the value and compare it. So again, it's about cloud spend decisions are driven by how we measure business value versus cost. So if you are doing something in the cloud and you want to get some visibility into it, you're gonna need some software, some tools, you're gonna to need something to help you out on this journey. So should you buy or build a platform? And when we're talking at scale, big cloud spenders are building their own, their own tools. So the um, FinOps Foundation panel discussion here said that the big cloud spenders, north of $100 million a year, uh, end up building, building their own tools. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, regardless of where you are, you probably want to start your journey with just the free tools that your cloud provider gives you. And then you might explore some sort of vendor SaaS solution to give you some insights and give you some ideas on, on how to connect the cost and, and with, with allocation. Maybe some open source solutions like Cloud Custodian. Uh, but then you might progress to building your own if you need to mature beyond what's, what's available there or a combination of a uh, mix, mix of those last two approaches and customizing what you can get from open source and vendor solutions. So the argument then for buy versus build, if you're at that big scale, when you build, you can align the data and the reporting with your org and with your financial requirements. You can then have the freedom to innovate and uh, decide what features you need and you can get them built into your own your own solution, uh, and then with compliance, so you can decide how you're going to comply with security and governance and build that into your, into your product and not wait on a vendor for that. And at scale, it is actually, can be actually cheaper to, to yeah, build your own platform, uh, even considering the total cost of the cloud resources you need, the engineers you need to run it, can be cheaper than some of the vendor solutions. 
the argument for buy is you get a bunch of features out of the box. You also get access to industry SMEs, so that can be good to sort of seed your, your journey with, with uh, some great knowledge. And they absorb the burden of a lot of the overhead of, of what goes into maintaining the platform. So if you're going to build your own, go in eyes open. There's a lot of data to process. We're talking sometimes billions of line items per month to process. And you need to keep up to date with changes in, that, in the cloud billing data. And you'll need uh, a team of engineers to help uh, keep it running. So our journey that we went on, if we go back 10 years, microservices were all the rage. Uh, DevOps, cloud native, woohoo, data center is dead. Let's go deploy to the cloud, everybody. OMG, cloud is expensive. <laughs> Where's all this money going? Who created all this stuff? OK, let's get some spreadsheets. Let's try and work out which account belongs to who. OK, and now we need to mature a bit beyond that. It's a bit unmanageable. Spreadsheets are yeah, getting out of hand. We're going to enforce. Everyone has to tag their resources, put an application tag on there, put a team tag on there, so we know who owns what. We uh, did use one of the vendor tools to help seed visibility, but we did build our own tools. And two of our separate brands at the time went on two parallel journeys. One brand used kind of a DevOps approach, where they uh, they got some consultants to come and help, and we used Dynamo, Redshift, Elastic, Kibana to build out this solution. The other brand was using a big data approach. So they brought in, uh, so they used S3 and Hive and Spark, and uh, that, that solution ended up being a lot more scalable, cheaper to run, much more flexible, and much more powerful. So we ended up going with that approach and bringing in the, the visualization layer and layering it on top from the other, other approach. Wait a minute, reorg, all right, who owns this stuff now? Okay, application tag and team tag no longer correlate, they're no longer accurate. All right, well let's decouple these bits of metadata and define a metadata service where application is the primary key. You just put application on your resource and we'll decouple all the other metadata. So your, your team, your email, your connectivity, uh, all, the stuff, all the data about your application, decouple that so you can update that separately to the, to the cloud resources. We built a recommendations engine called Costwatch. It was kind of a forerunner to AWS's compute optimizer. Every night it would generate recommendations for EC2 instances, EBS, RDS, ECS, send out those recommendations uh, to, the, to the teams. Whoa, Team X, you're spending a lot of money. You're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on EC2. What's going on here? Actually, we're building a platform. We've got thousands of customers. And these are the people that are actually spending the money. OK, now we need to, do, now we need to find a way to do chargebacks of platforms. So a way to separate out this is the cost for the platform actually gets attributed to the actual users deployed, deployed to the platform. What about SaaS licensing costs? So your big data, your observability tools, your different SaaS tools, that's also basically usage times rate. Can we charge that out to the different teams? So we built L&M chargebacks as part of the platform too. Where we're going now, what we're looking at is unit economics, that idea of tying the cost to the business value, the real-time dashboard, so it's really powerful. The book talks about this idea of the Prius effect. If you're driving a Prius, you can see how much are you using battery versus petrol, and that changes that live feedback, changes the way that you, you drive. And if we can give teams uh, real-time feedback into this is how many pods you're currently running since your deployment, and you can see the number of resources you're using real-time, that can actually change behavior and, and, and bring that back into optimizing the spend. Uh, and then sub-platform chargebacks. So Team X is running a platform, Team Y is also running a platform on top of Team X's platform. And then they've got customers that they want to charge back to. So chargebacks all the way down. So over the years then, we've collected a bunch of features that we've built uh, into, into our platform. I mentioned chargebacks, multi-cloud, adding in organizational hierarchy alignment, so your org chart, bringing that in, denormalizing all the data you get from the cloud by adding in all of the organizational hierarchy data so you can slice and dice by at different levels. Then the cloud provider data will invariably have different types of issues. So EC2 line items often come without instance types, which is important to know, so we'll fix that. Some resources you can't actually tag, so we'll work out, well, how do we charge that back to like the account owner or, or whatever. 
budgeting and predictions. So every month teams come in, they set their, update their budgets for how much they're going to spend. Uh, and we help out with uh, generating predictions with, with machine learning and anomaly reporting so that when there is a sudden spike in cost, we can send an email saying, hey, wait, you spent a whole bunch more money than, than you normally do, or you've exceeded your budget threshold, and they can get that feedback much quicker and rather than the bill shock at the end of the, the month or, or quarter. All right, I'm gonna dive deep a little into our pipeline and talk about how we build this tech technically. And like most pipelines, it starts with input, it has processing in the middle, and it has output. It all starts with the CUR, the cost and usage report from AWS. That comes in, we push that in to S3 using Spark and Hive, and we have a data lake, which is a massive set of tables of all the raw data we get, plus some intermediate tables, plus some very rich data products. Uh, so we mix in all the application metadata, the organizational metadata, and each of the platforms that onboards, they have their own little microservices that every hour are pushing all of the usage of their tenants uh, as data into the uh, platform usage API. And we have the predictions API. And then on the output side, various different dashboards, you can run ad hoc SQL queries, get powerful month on month, year on year, kind of histories and uh, comparisons pushing application costs to our developer portal on, on Backstage, and then that Kibana visualization layer where you can do that slicing and dicing by different parts of uh, different sorts of metadata. The personas that get involved, so on the left-hand side here, we've got our application engineer. They'll be the ones creating applications or updating app metadata using Backstage. Our different FinOps folk will get involved in the governance at the org metadata kind of level. Managers or senior engineers will be uploading predictions. And then platform engineers, they actually have a fairly uh, intricate role in working out well, what was all the usage for the last hour uh, for our platform, and how are we going to work out how much you know, CPU or memory or how many tables or streams or whatever were used, and we'll push that into the API. And then it's all driven by our FinOps starter engineers who get involved in all of the core bits of the pipeline and uh, the data lake. For the outputs, your FinOps, your managers, your app engineers, they all get involved in different data products that, that end up uh, on the right-hand side there. So the pipeline process then to actually create all of this starts with the ingestion phase, bringing in that CUR report, which can be billions of line items per month, Every day we read in a whole month's worth of data and we refresh the, the entire data, uh, data set. Uh, we cleanse it, so fixing instance type and other, other data, then we enrich it. So we add in the custom pricing, that amortization, the metadata, the platform chargebacks, and then we aggregate it down to that application level. So application is like our, our primary key. You wanna see all those, all those line items aggregated to the level that we care about. And reconciliations about fixing data integrity issues, doing auditing against the, the invoice, et cetera. Okay, so how do we do then the chargebacks for the platforms that run on top of uh, our infrastructure? So I mentioned chargeback is just take the cost and divide it by usage, but it's not quite that simple. So the challenge here is that for any, let's say we're running a containerized cluster for any given day, any given hour, there'll be instances coming and going, there'll be pods coming and going, so there can actually be a lot of fluctuation in, in the cost if we just expose that to users, uh, which complicates, you know, how much does my app cost now compared to, to uh, yesterday, and why am I seeing these changes? It would be similar if Amazon kind of exposed you to the actual cost of how many actual physical VMs were running in a data center. Instead, they set a, a, um, an instance price, uh, you know, price per instance type, so that you've got some idea of how much money you're gonna spend on different instances. So the solution here is to build out a consistent unit rate for the resources that you're charging for. So there are prerequisites there. You need to work out for your platform how are you gonna break it down. So an example, a very simple idea is with, if you're running containerized platform, just charge for CPU and memory, and we're gonna weight those 50-50. You could add in GPU, storage, and networking, those are a smaller percentage of the cost, then it might not be worth all the effort that's, that goes into actually tracking down all of those prices and all of those usage and, and uh, attributing it. 
So we work out what's what we call a platform compute unit, which is a tenant's proportion of the total capacity of the cluster, which is basically CPU plus memory. Uh, given a, any instance type, you're going to have more Gibby bytes of RAM than you are going to have cores. And so we work out our weighting. And the industry standards here, Amazon uh, Fargate, they use a factor of one core to nine Gibby bytes. And Cast AI use a factor of one to 7.3. We base it on the instance types and the ratio of CPU to memory. And that's how we, we will figure out the, the CPU weighting. And then you can calculate the unit rate, which you add up the total cost of the platform and divide that by all of the PCUs, so all the CPU and memory that's been submitted for all of the applications. That gives you the unit rate. And then you can charge that back to your tenants by multiplying their PCUs, their CPU and memory for the hour by, by the unit rate. OK, so we're going to switch now to the next topic, Kubernetes optimization. And in this, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, mostly AWS and EKS, and that's by far the most popular across the industry ways of deploying Kubernetes. Uh, but all the things that I'm going to talk here, they will apply to other, other platforms as well. Uh, and this is all based on, on, on my research, my, my most recent research. So what was our journey to kind of get to where we are now? We go back almost 10 years, different parallel brands within Expedia that weren't really uh, merged technically. Going back uh, to 2015, we had a big Amazon ECS uh, deployment, which still powers a lot of production today. It's one of our legacy platforms. Another brand was using Mesos and Nomad. Another brand was using Kubernetes on EC2, even before EKS. In 2020, COVID hit the travel industry. So that gave us a lot of time to look inwardly and start to look at consolidating all of our brands, all of our stacks, all of our technology and really streamlining things. So we built what we call the Runtime Compute Platform, which is running on EKS. And you can bring your own Helm chart and make it as complex as you want, and you've got the freedom to deploy however you want. Uh, but then we've also got the paved road experience. So with that, you get the integration with secrets management, and observability, service mesh, et cetera. We use AWS's Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter to help out with cluster optimization. And uh, now we're looking at this idea of autonomous right-sizing for the workloads. So we're going to talk about these different strategies involved here. OpenCost defines a specification on how to look at chargebacks and charging uh, for your Kubernetes platforms. And they split it into three main costs. You've got your resource allocation costs, and this is how much does it cost. These are the fixed costs, whether you use them or not. So your instances, your uh, load balances, whether you're using them or not, you're paying for them. So you, you allocate, you still pay for them. Usage is per, per like, if you say it's network usage, you pay per byte, you pay by the usage. Overhead costs will be your management fees, like your EKS fees, for, for example. Another way they split it down is looking at workload costs versus idle costs. So workload costs is all the pods that have been deployed. How much CPU and memory do they actually uh, reserve uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as a minimum reservation? And idle cost is all the stuff that goes unreserved. So you know, if you've got an eight core machine, and they've got pods running that take up four cores reservation, then you've got four cores of idle cost. It doesn't, doesn't go reserved. So these idle costs contribute to what we call shared costs. And that also includes those overhead costs, as well as the workloads that are required to actually keep the whole platform and cluster running. Things like your Kubernetes pods, your Istio, your Datadog, all those shared things that you need. So who should pay for shared costs? This is a never ending argument for every platform team and every platform owner that, uh, that goes through, through this process. Uh, and in the FinOps book, they mentioned three different methods. They advocate you should start with the platform team advocating the co uh, absorbing the costs. Uh, they, you know, the idea there is that forces them to optimize their platform, which is fair enough. Another way, share it uniformly. If there's 10 tenants, you charge them all 10% of the cost, no matter how much they actually reserve. The model we use is charge a proportionate amount. If you reserve 5% of the cluster, then you pay 5% of the overall uh, shared, shared costs, the overheads. So there's three different levels we can look at when we talk about optimization. In the bottom level, we're looking at infrastructure. 
And here we have hundreds of thousands of instances across all of Expedia. Around 12,000 of those would be in, in the kind of the Kubernetes footprint that we're talking about today. Uh, so it's a, it's a certain portion. Um, but at the infrastructure level, you've got to think about not just one platform, but all your platforms. Uh, and at the cluster level, we're talking about you know, 400 plus EKS clusters, 200,000 pods, and we've still got a lot of migration to come, so it's all, it's all growing. At the infrastructure level, the, uh, the strategies that get involved here, we've got the, the FinOps personas, and they're responsible for thinking about forecasting and budgeting, looking at historical usage, looking at the instance types that we've used in the past, all that easy to fleet. And what, uh, what are we gonna use in the future? Like how are we going to uh, predict, based on history, uh, what's, the best, uh, what's the best ways that we can come up with, uh, the, the best rates that we can negotiate, the best commitments, etc. So I mentioned before that uh, cost is usage times rate, and at this, this level, when you're thinking about all of the infrastructure, you don't have much control over usage because we've decentralized that. It's amongst all the teams deciding how they're going to use it. But what we do have is rate at this level. So uh, the FinOps team then could get involved in your rate negotiations, looking at how much uh, you know, of certain instance types we're using. Can we get a good savings plan or commitments or reserved instances? And can we negotiate a good enterprise discount based on historical usage and, and forecast? And at this level, what sort of KPI can we use to measure how effective we are with our commitments? There's a term called effective savings rate. This comes from a vendor by the name of ProsperOps. And they say, if you take actual spend with discounts, so how much did you pay upfront amortized for the month for your commitment? And then look at, well, how much would you have spent? What was your on-demand equivalent if you'd paid retail price? If you divide those into each other and then subtract that from one, if you come up with a negative value, like negative 0.2, and that's telling you that you actually wasted money with your commitment, you paid an extra 20% for your commitment, you would have been better off not having it at all and just going with the retail price. So it's a good KPI you can use to, to work out how effective you are at that level. Uh, they, ProsperOps, use, yeah, an ML approach to dynamically actually right-sizing your convertible reserved instances, refactoring them, maybe making them taller but shorter, or shorter but, and smaller, depending on your actual usage. So I think we're gonna see a lot in this, in this space on, uh, on optimizing uh, those, those kind of uh, negotiations around commitments. A few different vendors like Turbonomics, Spot, and Cast, they look at things like consolidating workloads onto instances, so you can free up instances for termination, or automating some of the spot purchasing decisions. And then at the cluster level, personas that get involved in optimization here, we're talking about your platform engineers. And the responsibilities here are ensuring that the, the nodes in the cluster are right-sized for the workloads. And configuring your tools like Cluster Autoscaler and Carpenter to take advantage of the FinOps negotiations. So looking, configure Carpenter to say, use these instance types that we get the best rates. Uh, and uh, making sure that we have that feedback loop between platform teams and the centralized FinOps teams. Some strategies that we can do here, even if it's just a manual thing, you go in once a week, you can at least go to all the clusters that you have that don't have any pods and just you know, downscale them to zero nodes and save the cost. You can delete any unclaimed volumes. For right sizing at the cluster level, we're talking about the different nodes that you need to, to spin up the cluster. Uh, and you probably want to have your, your nodes across multiple AZs, so maybe three AZs for redundancy. You probably want to start with small nodes for smaller clusters. You don't want 4x large instance types when you've only got one pod deployed. That's a lot of, a lot of wastage. And choosing instance families that have a best proportion of CPU to memory. So if you have a lot of pods that have uh, a lot of CPU and not much memory, then you probably want CPU uh, optimized instances rather than uh, memory optimized instances or, or vice versa. Uh, newer generations aren't always more cost effective, so you need to do your research on, on that as well. And different architectures will have different price ranges, uh, AMT versus Intel, then you've got Graviton, uh, and you can use spot instances if that's cheaper than, than your uh, enterprise rates or your, your commitments. Those last two items require some, some workload uh, compatibility, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we go up the stack and look at workloads and optimization at this level. So a bit of a primer here for Kubernetes for your workloads. 
say we have a core, I say we have an instance here with eight cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Let's just look at, at CPU. We have around eight, a little bit less than eight cores allocatable on the box. Um, there's two terms, request and limits. So request is how much you're reserving. This is the minimum you're reserving for your pod. So 2,000 millicores is the same as two cores, and that's reserved whether you use it or not. You get that, and Kubernetes will make sure that you always have that. And you may decide that you want to burst beyond that if there's extra capacity available, available on the box, and what you can do is configure limits. You can say, I reserve two cores, but I'm, I'm willing to go up to four cores if it's available on the box. Or you can just say, no limit, I'm, ready, I'm willing to burst way beyond that and, and use whatever's available on the instance. Okay, anyone want to have a guess across our industry, the average, what percentage of containers would use less than half of their requested resources? Any guesses? 90%, any other guesses? Let's have a look. It's greater than 65%, use less than half for CPU and for memory. The, uh, the, the biggest distribution on the left-hand side, that's less than 25%. So we're talking around less than 25% is about 50% utilization. And if you just ruled out the right-hand side of both those graphs, those are the, those are the containers that use more than, than what they've reserved. So you might be closer to your 90 mark if you rule out the, that, that part of the graph there. That's a lot of waste. Even if we just say two-thirds of containers don't even use half of their, their, um, uh, what they actually reserve. And so the issue we have here in the industry is trying to optimize, and, and it's tricky. It's a trade-off. There's a sweet spot between somewhere between cost and performance and reliability. And that sweet spot is a, is a moving target. So every single application is different and unique, and in each cluster and each environment it's, it's deployed to is different and unique. Your performance profile can change with every release. Adding new features could actually slow your application down. Customer demand can be spiky and unpredictable. And as your platform matures, it itself may get more or less efficient at um, how it actually runs, runs your pods at, at scale. When we talk about cost, it's not just the cloud spend, the amount of resources you reserve. It's also about the time that you spend. How much do you invest in optimizing? And how much of that do you recoup in, uh, in, in saved cost and improved performance? So we did a bit of uh, research in, internally about this problem in the industry, this you know, massive amount of waste and how can we automatically address some of this. Uh, we got a lot of feedback in from management, from architects, from platform engineers, different application teams. And it kind of came back to a, a trade-off between responsiveness and stability is kind of, a, kind of the highlights that I kind of pick, picked out of that, uh, those, those responses. And, with the responsiveness, we're talking about we want to try and hug the demand curve as much as possible. So you know, scaling in horizontally and vertically when we're not using the resources, but being quick to scale out and scale up when we do need those resources and respond to customer demand. And that, when we can capture that, we can then lower the cost. But the more that we're actually making all these fine-grained configuration decisions and, and, and uh, changes, Potentially, the more instability we're adding because we're doing more changes more frequently. And there's going to be contention with all of our other tools that are interacting with our workloads, like our CI CD releases, our rollbacks, our failover, disaster recovery, whatever it might be. So, at this level, we've got all the different personas application engineers, platform engineers, our CCOE folk that can get involved. And the responsibilities here are twofold, ensuring that our workloads aren't over-provisioned, but also ensuring that they're kept reliable. So another quick primer, Kubernetes defines three different quality of service classes. Best effort, which basically you shouldn't use. <laughs> it's like, I'll stick my pod out somewhere, but if Kubernetes needs the, all the CPU and memory, it will just delete the pod. Uh, so not, not recommended. Then you've got guaranteed, where you say requests and limits are the same, so it's non-burstable. Burstable is where request, uh, request is less than limits or you don't have any limits and you just go as, as, much, as far as you want. With requests then for CPU, if you set CPU too low, you end up starving or throttling and you end up with performance issues because you don't have enough. You don't have enough time slices on, on the CPU to get your work done. And with memory, if your setting is too low, 
then you're at risk of actually being killed by the dreaded oom kill event from uh, Kubernetes. They just, it says you've run out of memory, you try to uh, use too much memory, and it will just kill your pod altogether. All you set them too high, then we have this inefficiency problem, which is pretty much an industry default. So I did some research. What's the best practice out there? Uh, surely there's some gui guidance around this. When it comes to memory, it seems fairly in incontrovertible. Most people are saying you should go for guaranteed. You should set, re set requests and limits to the same thing. You avoid this idea of oom kills. Uh, when you burst beyond what you have and then it, it gets reclaimed, you're just setting yourself up for disaster. For CPU, there's no real industry consensus. You've got two main options between burstable and guaranteed. And there's a few things to think about. So with burstable, where you set requests less than limits or you don't set limits at all, uh, people are saying you should do this because then you can take advantage of the spare cycles. If you burst beyond what you need, then you're just you're responding to customer demand or whatever it might be. And then your HPA, your horizontal pod order scaling, will kick in eventually and it will spin up new pods, which will then take some of that, uh, alleviate some of the pressure on, on those pods. Uh, but you really need to know what you're, you're doing. You need to know what your SLOs are. You need to know what your requests should be. You need to do some testing in, in pre-prod, some load testing to, to know what you're doing there. Other people say you should go with guaranteed uh, because if you're bursting in pre-production uh, and then you go to production and there's other pods that are doing a lot of bursting, uh, it's a different environment and you've come to expect something different from pre-prod. Uh, and, it, and another argument is if you have guaranteed for memory, and then so memory is not bursting, it's fixed, but CPU is bursting. Um, if you're using a lot of CPU uh, and you haven't set up like your HPA properly to, to spin up new nodes, then the more CPU you're using, in theory, the, probably the more memory your, your uh, pod is, is, is going to want so they can put pressure on, on memory. And then the other argument is that with uh, Kubernetes, there's a setting called uh, static CPU manager. You set it at the cluster level. And if you have guaranteed uh, quality of service on your pods and you have a whole number of cores, so 1,000 millicores, 2,000 millicores, then you can actually get an affinity assigned for your pod to a CPU. You don't have to share that CPU with other, with other pods and get uh, better, better performance. There's some strategies we can apply at this level. So your platform engineers, again, whether it's scripted or manual, you can go in and delete, under, uh, delete abandoned work, workloads and namespaces, delete unclaimed volumes, and you can reward compatibility with cheaper infrastructure. So at deploy time, maybe you can add a label to your pod that says I'm Graviton ready or I'm spot, you know, I'm interruptible. And then you can have your affinity assigned for those types of labels with Use Carpenter to say these uh, pods can go on these types of instances, and then you can reward those teams with cheaper interest rates, lower interest, uh, sorry, lower unit rates for those types of instance types. You can set up some basic right sizing policies at, at the start. So go out with some sensible defaults, as you know people don't configure it. Decide what is the best practice and what quite a, what kind of quality of service do we want to have, and what do we want to set as your sensible defaults. And then your FinOps folks can help uh, your platform engineers get involved with actually generating recommendations. Uh, so shifting left recommendations is really powerful. So we built a tool called Optimate, which uh, when someone makes a change to a Helm chart, to their, to their uh, requests and limits, say they go from one core to two cores, uh, on the PR, before it gets merged, we push a little comment that says, well, You've just gone from one core to two cores and you maximum up to 200 pods, that's going to cost you an extra I don't know, 50 bucks a month or whatever. And people see that comment and they're like, and, it's, and we've seen people actually go back and they have Slack conversations about it and say, oh, I didn't realize, do we want to do this? And some people say, I totally forgot I actually changed that. I didn't mean to actually commit it. And so it's that little assistant there that giving you the feedback early on before you actually merge. Uh, you can do the same thing like a GitOps type approach of generating recommendations and then submitting them as pull requests, again, bringing that into the developer's workflow. When it comes to making recommendations, uh, memory is a little harder because there's a lot of things that go into runtimes and understanding you know, the JVM settings or whichever, whichever runtime you're using. Uh, CPU is a little easier to get started with making recommendations. It's that compressible resource. 
And what you want to do here is try and close the gap between usage or utilization and actual requests. So you can divide usage by requests and you kind of get a utilization rate. But don't go by the average statistic because that hides a lot of your distribution curve and this a mistake I've made in the past. Pretty much industry standard is using TP95 or, or, or 99. Uh, you can set a policy that says, okay, if my TP95 for the last two weeks never went above uh, 10%, then I'm gonna make a recommendation of, let's say, 10%, your, no, your TP95 figure, plus uh, you know, 100%. So an example might be, you've reserved one core, your 95th percentile comes through, says for the last two weeks, you never used more than 100 millicores, so the recommendation we're gonna make is 200 millicores, which is very safe, very conservative, uh, and you can just do that, and, and, and uh, if they pick up that recommendation, observe it a few weeks later, and see if you wanna make a, another recommendation. KubeCost has an example on a, on a blog of theirs. Say if you have a tier one application, you might want to go four nines percentile plus uh, 100%. Or for a dev uh, box, you might just say, cut you off at 95th percentile. Uh, that's, that's our recommendation. But beyond just making recommendations, we need automation. Why do we need it? So the state of FinOps report for the last few years running, asking organizations all around the world, the number one challenge everyone reports is basically getting engineers to implement recommendations, getting engineers to do stuff, which is harsh. It's a harsh way of putting it because engineers have a thousand things to do and engineers want to optimize. That's, you know, that's, what, that's what we've been trained to do. It's what we love to do. But it's risky, right, to go and make a change to your Kubernetes settings when it's kind of, it's running and you've got a thousand other feature requests and things that you need to do. So another need for reason for the need for automation, uh, say you have 10 microservices and you release them once a week, you think about all the different input variables that could go into how you can configure it, there's 360,000 permutations of, of you know, choices you could make in, in, in one month. So that's not a human problem, that's, that's a machine learning problem. Whether you buy or build a solution in this space, we need bravery. And this is all across the industry, talking to experts. The, the only way we're gonna see measurable outcomes is with, with, with automation. And bravery is the, the biggest barrier for, for organizations. So you need the willingness to go out, test, learn, try things out. And companies that do have this bravery can see really high success rates from this. Uh, and that's what the cloud's about, the flexibility, elasticity, responding to the variable cost nature of the cloud. So should you buy or should you build an automated solution in this space? I like to think about it if you, you, looking at your runtime stack, looking at the apps that are deployed to your platform. On the left-hand side, if you have a lot of freedom of choice, a lot of autonomy, bring your own whatever, JVM, Golang, Rust, whatever you want, bring, bring your own. Or on the right-hand side, if you're highly standardized, you will deploy with Spring Boot on JVM, and these are the things that you must do. The more standardized you are, probably, the more you can build your own solution. On the left-hand side, there's just a lot of input variables that you're gonna have to cater for, a lot of things you're gonna have to think about, all the different runtime variables, all the different metrics that you need to look at. On the right-hand side, you can standardize on golden signals and say this is how we measure latency or whatever performance uh, metric you wanna use. And so you can build some tooling and we've talked to companies that are doing that themselves. They take away the request, the limits, the HPA settings from their, from their developers and they, they configure it all with machine learning themselves. Uh, on the buy side of things, there's a bunch of vendors. If you go to the continuous optimization category in CNCF, you'll see this. Um, and I like to kind of split them into three different strategies, whether you build it yourself or you, you go with uh, one, of the, one of the vendor solutions. The low-level magic solution is a company called Granulate's an example here. You use some machine learning to look at your workload running over a couple of weeks, and they optimize very low-level decisions for you, and you can see CPU kind of dropping by, by 30%. Next step is actively configuring your resources. So you're going tweaking your horizontal and your vertical scaling, configuring the, 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 configuring the uh, Kubernetes values. And based on machine learning, reinforcement learning, taking a safety first conservative approach, just doing small changes gradually over time and, and using reinforcement learning. So when there's a new release, you do a relearning phase. 
And uh, third one is exploring optimal configuration. So going into pre-prod and using a data science kind of approach to looking at, well, how can we explore those 360,000 permutations with some experiments and using the decisions that it gives you on cost and performance trade-offs to then inform your production configuration. So when it comes to uh, adopting automation, uh, these are some five tips to kind of close us out. First of all, you want to empower engineers with choice. So just giving them like a simple choice over threshold, like 95th versus 99th percentile. And they, the engineers will then feel a sense of control, psychological ownership. Like these are my recommendations because I've tuned them. They have them, the flexibility to, to configure that before they deploy. And your uptake increases. You need to be above reproach, so don't go out there with average statistics and just say, this is the average, set it to this. Uh, you, need, you need realistic and um, conservative values. You've got two extremes in your, in your customers for your platform. You're going to have zero trust and you have blind trust. Blind trust is there must be some awesome machine learning behind this. Yep, <laughs> go deploy to prod, no probs. Others are zero trust. I'm running a tier one critical service. You're not coming anywhere near me with any of this automation and stuff. So you need to earn trust over time um, by making trustworthy recommendations and erring on the side of caution. There's no one-size-fits-all approach, so some workloads are easily interruptible and restartable. Others, if they want to run for as long as possible until they do another deploy, maybe there's a bit of tech debt, they were quickly spun up or lifted and shifted from the data center. And others, they have really long startup times, so they set their CPU thresholds really low, say like 20% CPU utilization, so that the horizontal scaling has enough lead time to spin up the new instances so they can go uh, they can grow their uh, current CPU usage while they're waiting for the new ones to come along. So you can't always assume that low, low utilization is because of poorly designed thing. It could be actually uh, a symptom of uh, trying to overcome a, a different issue. Exploring the Pareto front is hard. So here I'm talking about trying to optimize for two output variables, cost and performance. It's a difficult machine learning problem. And there's so many different input parameters. Tweaking CPU can have an impact on memory and vice versa. Last tip, timing is everything. So scaling vertically and horizontally, it needs some careful observation or bake in times in between making changes. And otherwise, if you're making changes too frequently, then you're introducing a lot of thrashing of, of pods in, in between. And you don't want to go out making these changes during your peak traffic times. So you want to train your, uh, your um, automation to work in the off-peak times and make sure there's enough time between changes. So we looked at FinOps. We talked about how it's a collaboration between finance and engineering. We centralize our rate negotiation and our best practices. And we keep our ownership of our cloud resource decentralized because we've now got a way of communicating. And we talked about Kubernetes optimization, allow personas working together to optimize the entire stack. We need that automation to realize the true cost savings. We need to be, re we need to be brave and realistic and above reproach. To close us out with some resources, I mentioned the FinOps book. There's some great podcasts. Slack channel's great. Everyone's really welcoming in, this, in the FinOps community. So jump in there. Uh, certification on FinOps.org. Some different YouTube channels with the different vendors that have some great uh, videos on Kubernetes optimization. And there's a, uh, some good podcasts out there to listen to. So that's my, that's my talk. We might have time for a question or two.